Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is David Swanson. I'm executive director of World Beyond War, and I'm very grateful that I've been asked to, to help with a little tech support on this call because I'm looking forward to, to hearing it. Um, this is uh, the World Beyond War Ireland chapter event featuring Marie McGuire, and it's the fourth part of a five part series. And we are recording and we'll be sending out the recording afterwards. Uh, the closed captions are turned on. And if you want to view them, you can click the CC button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, be aware that there will be mistakes. It is uh, words generated by a robot. Um, we will be using the chat box for questions. So put your questions in the chat box and I will turn everything over to Miriam. David, you're all very welcome to the Irish chapter of World Beyond War. In 1962, Russia and America, through long protracted and very difficult talks, succeeded in a peace agreement where Nikita Khrushchev agreed to remove Russian nuclear missiles from Cuba and John F. Kennedy agreed to remove American nuclear missiles from Turkey thus avoiding the danger of a wider world conflict and a possible nuclear war. Khrushchev said, any fool can start a war, but once it's done, even the wisest are helpless to stop it, especially if it's a nuclear war. JFK said that those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. So the, the cruel war in Ukraine must end. All war everywhere, in Yemen, in Somalia, in Palestine, in Syria, these relentless wars must end before all the children's playgrounds are turned into graveyards. The children of the world deserve better. So this evening, our host, Barry Sweeney, who's the convener of Irish chapter of World Beyond War, will be in conversation with Mairead Maguire, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate. Our respondent will be Eilish Ward, an academic and writer. And Eamon, Ryan, Eamon Rafter will host your questions. So thanking you all for joining us and over to you, Barry. Very good, thank you very much, Miriam. And a very warm welcome to everybody, especially to you, Mairead. I'm really honoured to be uh, interviewing this e you this evening. You're a person who should be celebrated, who is celebrated, um, but who should be celebrated even more. Um, anyone who has followed you over the years uh, will know that one of the most consistent traits to your activism is your total condemnation of all violence. Uh, I was wondering, could you tell us uh, about how you came to that realisation? Well, thank you very much, Barry. Um, and thank you for everyone who's organised this Zoom meeting. Very important at this particular time. Well, how I came to have a passion for peace and a total commitment to non-violence and to peaceful solution to conflict was living in the height of the troubles in Northern Ireland when we had a violent ethnic political conflict. And I remember living in the heart of West Belfast and experiencing this violence in my own community and asking myself, do you ever take a gun? Uh, do you ever use violence? So I came on a very uh, personal journey um, to what was the right thing to do? And I came in after, after a long time to absolute conviction that um, you, you don't kill people for your any purpose, for religious or political purposes. They are all made in the image of God, each of us. And uh, just to get my way or prove my point, I'm not allowed to take a gun and kill someone. So when I came into that absolute conviction of peace uh, and conflict resolution, um, I knew then that I was, I didn't really understand the word pacifism, but it wasn't common in my everyday vocation. But I, 
I did then come to the absolute conviction, no, you don't kill people. And you solve your problem through conflict resolution, through dialogue. And that's how I came into my, my conviction of peace. Very good. And can you tell me, I've, I've heard you mention the importance of both political and spiritual solutions as part of a peace process. Uh, could you tell us what do you mean by spiritual solutions? And can you give us any examples of political approaches to de-escalate violence? Well, I think we are already aware of political approaches. I mean, if you want to solve a problem, any problem, you have to get the people sitting around a table and saying what their problem is and begin to accommodate each other and solving that problem together. I mean, all wars come to an end, as well as Ukrainian one in Russia. But the sooner it comes to an end, the better, because then less people die. So um, the only solution to any conflict is dialogue, is peace, is negotiating, is getting the people involved in that around the table. Um, with regard to the spiritual aspect of it, I don't necessarily mean a religious approach to it. I mean, the spirit, we all know what the spirit is. I mean, every human being knows the spirit of themselves and they know that peace starts inside their heart. Um, uh, and one of the most important spiritual things to finding a peace solution is forgiveness. Because often we find that beneath a lot of these conflicts, there has been a history to them. Uh, and people have maybe remained in the past, remembering the injustice done and feeling angry. And then the emotions get out of place. So I think forgiveness and reconciliation are very important aspects of any peace process. And we've seen that proved with the like of Bishop Tutu when he worked for uh, against apartheid in South Africa and after the terrible tragedies. One of the things he focused on was the need for people to be reconciled, to, to admit to the wrong, but to move forward and forgiveness, the key to peace. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Definitely. Of course, forgiveness is very closely linked, linked with the uh, admissions of wrongdoing and honest conversations. Um, uh, so in Ireland, we have firsthand experience with the peace process, with reconciliation, with uh, dialogue. Uh, can you tell me how have the political and uh, how the spiritual solutions, how have they been enshrined or championed or safeguarded in Ireland? Well, we were very lucky because there were some very good people who gave a lot of their time to recognise that everyone had to be brought on board the peace process, that you couldn't isolate uh, and marginalise any section of the community, um, uh, and, and you couldn't um, you couldn't uh, embarrass them or say, well, they were part of the problem, we're not talking to you. We had to talk to absolutely everyone and get around the table and get out what exactly was causing the problems. Uh, and we were very blessed in having people who were capable of doing that. But you know, once we got the Good Friday Agreement, um, it was only the beginning, it wasn't the end of the process. We merely got people to say, put up the guns. And one of the important things inside that Good Friday or peace process was the acknowledgement that we couldn't solve our problems through violence. We had to do it by putting the guns up. And it was a commitment, which was absolutely marvelous commitment by the, the political parties involved, the British Irish government, the armed people who had taken part in the armed struggle, all committed to that profound statement saying, we won't use violence to solve our problems. We will have dialogue. And that's very important in any peace process. Tragically, a lot of people didn't remember that commitment, but we have to reaffirm it because it is the only way to safeguard our future. You know, we're shocked by what is now happening in Russia, 
and in the Ukraine. Uh, absolutely horrific. It will never be solved militarily. But if our peace process is fully implemented as we go along, and it's going to take more time, at least we can use that as a light to the world and say ethnic political problems can only be solved through being all inclusive and respecting people uh, and acknowledging they have problems. You know, currently we're looking at this process in now with Russia and with Ukraine. I mean, Russia has problems, as has the Ukraine. But if we were listening closer, the people involved are laying out how they see a solution, particularly Putin and the Russian government. Here is how we might have a solution. This is our problem. But we're so busy banging the drums of war and demonizing each other and those political leaders, we're not listening to what they're saying that might help us solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, well said. I, I do find that the, the voices for peace are being quite marginalized and not taking very seriously at the moment. Um, before I, I move on, I do most definitely want to talk to you about Ukraine um, in a moment. I'd like to just continue with Ireland one more moment. So we have the, the Good Friday Agreement, the commitment to nonviolence. Uh, how do you think Ireland is performing under that particular lens? Um, you know, with its domestic policies, uh, with its international policies, um, how, how would you rate Ireland's performance? Well, I would be very sad that both parts of Ireland uh, are not doing it all well with regard to their performance to uphold what was in the Good Friday Agreement. We have the North of Ireland, which of course is part of NATO, and we have the South of Ireland, which I am very, very sad to say has completely ignored the Southern people's uh, a um, commitment to neutrality. I've been many times down to Shannon, where American troops have gone through Shannon Airport, going off to fight illegal wars uh, and being uh, complicit with the killing of many children. Because if you are fueling the soldiers and their armaments going through Shannon to go to Iraq, Afghanistan, all those countries, then we are complicit with war. So I'm very disappointed in the Irish government. Um, I would like to see them uphold their neutrality, which is a very, very val valuable and important thing. Instead of looking towards militarism, militarism and the, the uh, increase of militarism of Europe, where will that take us but towards a third world war? And if neutral countries like Ireland can't be a, a light to an alternative to militarism and war and killing. I mean, wh where do we look for this light? Yes, uh, I, I would definitely second everything you've, you've said there. In fact, I, I believe you have been part of a recent initiative called the Downpatrick Declaration to try and maybe you might tell us the purpose, what it is and the purpose of the Downpatrick Declaration. Well, I live uh, outside Down Patrick. That's where I do my shopping. Though I'm originally from Belfast, I'm a city woman. But I, uh, in Down Patrick, uh, we decided some of us were very concerned uh, that um, Ireland is moving away from its neutrality and it's becoming more and more involved in these uh, military escapades. Yeah. Uh, and so we the arms trade in Ireland is growing. Here in Belfast, we have the Thales, which make armaments and sell them over to the British government, which go to these wars. I mean, it is horrific to think we fought and got ourselves out of over 30 years of violent ethnic conflict. And here we have and the government help and support arms manufacturers to be part of killing people in Yemen, we children in Yemen is being absolutely destroyed and the Western arms are paying for it. 
So some of us got together, some people from the south, some people from the north, and we set up the John Patrick Declaration, which affirms that in our Good Friday Agreement, uh, we will not use violent means in order to solve political conflicts. And we have launched that. And we've launched it around the dates of uh, St. Bridget and St. Colum Kill and St. Patrick, because our, our tradition, uh, our history from many different sections of our community is one of peacemaking. We're not militarists. We don't want to be part of the military. Uh, we don't want to be part of NATO. Um, and we oppose that. So this Good Friday Agreement uh, oppose, oppose peacemaking and the declaration, which you can see on the website, please look at it. And if you agree, sign on, because we all need to raise our voices against this race to militarism and war, which will destroy our world. Mm -hmm. Well said, Mairead. Yeah, the, the, it's quite hypocritical, really, the, the total commitment to non-violence, to solving uh, uh, the situation in the north. And the use of Shannon Airport, over two million, two and a half million battle troops going to battle armed with guns. That doesn't seem like much of a commitment to me. Similar to more, exactly, you very well pointed out the hypocrisy in shouting and screaming for the poor women in the Ukraine, which is absolutely right, but total silence on Yemen. It's it just hypocrisy all around us. But moving on towards the Ukraine, um, unlike Iraq's mythical weapons of mass destruction, the Russian and American nuclear weapons do actually exist. And this time we do face a real possibility of mushroom clouds in Europe and in the world. Um, we in World Beyond War Ireland last week, we wrote to all the Irish members of European Parliament, asking them to challenge the rhetoric for war. And if I could just read uh, one reply came to us, I just want to read one sentence to you. this particular politician said, when the time, when the time for a peaceful resolution to the current uh, crisis inevitably comes, we must use our position on the United Nations Security Council to aid in brokering a fair truce. So my question to you is, do you think we should wait until the violent ends? You know, is that all Ireland can do? Just wait? Uh, you know, how important do you think it is to de-escalate the situation in the Ukraine immediately? And considering the knowledge that Ireland has gained through its painful past. What role do you think Ireland could play? What opportunities do you see for Ireland to be peace brokers? Oh, I think the, uh, I think the hostility now between what's happening in Russia and the Ukraine should stop immediately, absolutely immediately. We're not going to wait another day, another week, to see young men and women die and kill each other. It's not on, it's not acceptable. And I, I thought the fact that Russia went into Ukraine is horrible. I, I just absolutely don't agree with that. You never solve problems by doing that. Uh, and so we know that it can be solved. And are we going to wait another 30 years for somebody to stand up and say it's, it's, it's not on? Ireland has a great role. Ireland played a great role in helping here bring peace in Northern Ireland. They know the steps. They know what to do. The British government helped bring peace here in Northern Ireland. They know what to do. And they're doing the exact opposite with regard to what's happening now in Russia and in Ukraine. Can you just imagine, had Ireland sent into Northern Ireland weapons, lethal weapons, and, and, and said to the kids in Northern Ireland, in my area, take a gun and go out there and fight your own war. That is, there, there are people who say that sit in their sitting rooms and tell kids to go out and take a gun and kill other kids and kill R Russians. I mean, it's just hypocrisy of the utmost. 
We do not need to send weapons into these countries and enough weapons. What we need to send and what we need is for some peacemakers, some political leaders with some kind of wisdom and compassion to say very clearly to the Russians, hey, stop it. We don't want this. And to say to the Ukrainians, we don't want this. We don't want people going standing on shores and acting the way as if they're young, young Churchillians killing others and encouraging others to kill. This would have been solved weeks ago had the West stood up and said, no, we're not going to give in to blackmail by either Ukraine or, 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 or Russia. Stop it. And I think if we had stronger leadership, instead of what we're seeing, Ireland practically becoming part of NATO, and, and, and it's sitting on the Security Council and could very well say to the Security Council, look, we've experienced, we saw ethnic political conflict in Northern Ireland, violence doesn't work, do it another way. Where's the Irish voice saying that? No, and America, America has disappointed the world because all America is asking us, is giving us, is wars, wars and wars, more wars. I, I visited those countries, I was in Iraq, when kids were dying in the thousands for the economic sanctions put on we children, is that what we're going to offer the Russian kids now and the Ukrainian kids? For them to die painfully in hospitals and destroying their homes? Look, it's time we had political leaders with some kind of vision. I thought we had them in Ireland, but I'm afraid I'm very disappointed with the Irish government and absolutely appalled by the British government. And as for America, it's a disgrace to the world mm. for what they're doing. They're taking us into NATO, and if we don't join NATO and don't do what we're told, then we are we're leaving ourselves open to be bombed. I understand why Russia was afraid of being bombed because Russia watched what, what, what NATO done in Libya, destroyed the country and their leader. I understand, and they, they destroyed Iraq and thousands and thousands of weak children died being, I was in the hospital standing at their beds, and they don't have to no nothing, they seen that. So people understand, NATO has to be dissolved. It's a military alliance offerings nothing but war. Um, people of the world can't live like this. Do you know we're not even allowed now to express our point of view? The, America has cut off Russian television. We're not even allowed to hear what our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and in Russia say. And if we say anything, we're accused of being against one country. Well, I know I'm for life. I'm for the human family. I'm for the world living together and solving its problems. I'm not for NATO. I'm not for militarism and war. And I'm not, I oppose what Russia did in walking into Ukraine. And it's time it took its soldiers and went home. Well said, Marlid. Um <clears throat> Yeah, I, I find your the, the point you just made there very interesting about that we can't, analyze the situation at all if we stop to think and reflect it reminds me of september the 11th if you stop to reflect at all unpatriotic you know we must go to war uh, and if we happen to, to analyze the ukraine and russia at all well then we're shills for putin and we're paid by putin there's a very quick judgmental time we're living in um so um, I was going to ask you about the solutions that are, uh, I use solutions in a loose way, the solutions that are being used at the moment, the sanctions, the 500 billion arms donation from the European Union to the Ukraine, the distancing between the different parties. Um, what do you think on those developments? Well, in any situation where there is violence going on and conflict, and Ukraine is deeply, deeply complicated with a long history, um, as is Ireland. We know in Northern Ireland, it wasn't a simple matter of just saying, 
we get peace now and we get it tomorrow. We knew we have a history. We have to build relationships here in Northern Ireland. We have to come together as a people and solve the problem. And it took a long, long time. And it's the same in the Ukraine. The president of the Ukraine, Zelensky, I would love him to understand. We know you have problems and you have grievances, but please, violence is not going to solve them. Sit down with President Putin, why not? And talk to him and find a way through this and find a way that you can look at neutrality for your country because that would be one of the things that helped bring down the tension because people are afraid, the Russians are afraid, the Ukrainians are afraid and other countries around them are afraid. Sit down with your people and with Putin and some of his people. I applaud the peace talks that are going on at the minute, but they need to be put at a higher level with Putin, who is the leader of Russia, and stop demonizing Putin. He's made mistakes. We all make mistakes. We're mistake people. We're human. Sit down and talk. Don't allow him to be demonized from the outside, because, you know, you look at the last 12 years, how many leaders have we demonized? Saddam Hussein in Iraq, we demonized him. Gaddafi in Libya, we demonized him and killed him. How many, you can just think, oh, that's the way it works. You demonize the leader, then you demonize the people, then you make them think that they can't solve problems. I was in Russia some 50 years ago, and the appeal from kids in the street to me in Moscow was, we want peace. We don't want our government building weapons and weapons. But we feel the West is leading us with weapons and weapons. I went to America, and what did I learn in America? They were talking about Russia as if it was some place in the moon. Instead of been talking about Russia as their brothers and sisters with problems, and we need to work together to solve climate change, poverty, pandemic, these things need, we need to work together. We cannot afford to demonize Russia and humiliate them. We have humiliated the Russian people for 60 years. They are a, a good people. It's the largest country in the world. It's full of culture and beauty. I was absolutely blown away with the kindness of the Russian people, the kindness of them. And it breaks my heart to think now they're going to be isolated and marginalized and demonized and sanctions are going to put on them to kill them and to kill their country. I could weep at that. And I feel the same about the American people. My, my great great grandfather's American, but the American people are better than wars and militarism and killing other countries. They're better than that. And I say that as somebody who's gone many times to America. And America helped Northern Ireland in the peace process. For that, we're grateful. Now I say to the American people, stand up against militarism and war, because if we don't, we will put off nuclear weapons, we will kill each other, and what are we offering the children of the world? Is that what we're offering our little children? To hate your brothers and sisters in Moscow? To hate your Chinese brothers and sisters? Why? It's just crazy. So please, 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 my, my appeal is to Putin and to Yeltsin and to, uh, to, for neutrality in the Ukraine. Why mm -hmm. not? Why not be neutral? And Ireland, please maintain your neutrality. Be a light to the world. Don't sell your soul for a pittance and a few weapons just to be in with the big boys. Remember your humanity. Mm -hmm. Well said, Mairead. Um, and of course, Ukraine was actually neutral um, for a period there until 2014, when the, the, there was the, the coup and the, 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 the present Ukrainian government got in. They were neutral and they could very easily switch back to it. And that would certainly be a step towards de-escalating. Um, I, I'm very happy you touched on humiliation there. Um, you referenced it to the humiliation of the Russian people. Yeah. But the connection between humiliation and violence is very well established. You know, even if you go to any of these 
uh, prisons, you know, why are you here? Uh, he disrespected me. He humiliated me, you know, so from personal violence to Germany being humiliated after World War I, being blamed entirely for World War I, that anger, that anger contributes then to further, um, further violence. So you get these fake pieces, you know, fake peace after World War I, which is really a direct contribution to World War II. That, that was part of the anger of World War II. Do you think we're going to get more fake peace after the Ukraine? Another gunboat diplomacy, sign this or else type of situation? Or do you think we can treat each other with some decency? I think we have to try to say to the, um, the media, you know, Truman said to us, to the American people, to beware of the military industrial complex because it'll destroy your democracies and they'll take over. And now we have the military industrial complex plus the media complex, where media, instead of being truth tellers and trying to educate us as to what's going on in our world, are serving us fake news, if they're even allowed to service anything. I mean, now today, it is absolutely scary. We have no human rights. We have no freedom of the press. I mean, if peace voices are never heard, we're being marginalized. You know, people phone me here and say, what are you going to say? And when I tell them, they phone me back and say, I haven't time to interview you. They won't even give space for alternative viewpoints, even, and I'm totally non-violent, always have been. I've spent years going around the world trying to understand why we're at this and what's happening. They don't want to know. And you know, this is a disgrace because this is leading us to a very dangerous situation. What we do, we, we, we lock up our truth tellers and we give them medals to the warmongers. And that's where we're at. And that's a very, very dangerous place to be. I mean, I'm very conscious of Julian Assange. Julian Assange told the truth of what was happening in those Middle Eastern countries. And when we were in Iraq and, I, and, and Afghanistan, coming home from Afghanistan, I said to the young people, we're going now to London to see Julian Assange in prison. We're campaigning that that man be released. And those young people in Afghanistan wrote him a letter and cheered the place down. And they said, he told the truth about what is happening in our country. You know, Julian Assange is a hero. He should be released, not locked up in, in a prison and being prepared to be sent to a dungeon in America. That's not good enough. We need to uphold the truth tellers. And we need to say to our media, stop feeding us fake news, tell the truth and help us save your world because it's your world too. Exactly, yes. Uh, there does seem to be quite selective, selective reporting or manipulative reporting, uh, we could say by the prostitutes. Um, and we have the suppression of exactly truth tellers peace activists, a Shannon Airport, I know that the peace activists there are being harassed, even up environmentalist activists up in Rossport are harassed, like you say, journalists, whistleblowers. Um, what effect do you think that has, does that have all this silencing of, op of uh, opposition voices and how important is it for people to stand up and be heard? You know, don't be afraid. The effect of all this silencing is to make people afraid. I remember nominating Mordecai Valnunu for the Nobel Peace Prize many years ago and going to visit him in Israel. And, and he told the world that Israel had nuclear weapons. And Israel captured him, took him, put him in a prison for years, and when he'd finished after 18 years solitary confinement in an Israeli prison, most, most cruel, instead of letting them out, to this day, Mordecai Van Nunu is held in Israel and not allowed to go anywhere. 
Now, I said to a young Israeli person, why is the Israeli government doing this to Mordecai? He's done his term, why didn't they let him out? And she said to me, they do that to spread fear and silence the people. In our world today, we have governments who instead of upholding human rights and doing what is right, do the like of this to spread fear because they say, oh, look what happened to Mordecai. Look what happened to Julian Assad. Look what happened to Ed Snowden because he told about the surveillance we're under. You know, I mean, so governments operate like this. The only way to break that down is to say, we're not afraid. This is our world, this is our children, and we're going to tell the truth, and we're going to work for human rights and the right to freedom of speech. So we have to uphold that. I was so sad on the 11th of September when all those people in America were killed. I remember to this day, I got out of my car and ran in to hug my children because I was so sad. When that happened, America had an opportunity to open its big heart and say to the world, we have to stop this violence. We have to be friends. And what did it do? It did the opposite. It started a war on terror and terrorized the Middle East and other countries, torturing men in, in, in Abu Ghraib and places like that. Rendition flights run through Ireland, Poland, other countries. There's none of us innocent in this. We're all guilty. But rendition flights, torture flights. And those governments never opened their mouths when men in the Middle East were being tortured. You know, it's crazy. But it's not too late. There's enough of us to turn this round. We can make it. In Northern Ireland, when peace people started, people said to me, you're wasting your time. There'll never be peace in Northern Ireland. It'll never stop. And we said, there will be peace. I passionately believe it's not too late to build an alternative world. And we start where we are, in our own homes and in our communities. This is where we start. So I'm very proud of all the Irish peacemakers. I, I think they're just amazing. But I'm also very proud of all the other peacemakers I've met. And that what to say to the governments, you have to have policies that are fair and just. And the foreign policies of the American government and the British government and Europe, Europe has let us down. Europe, instead of helping the dialogue between Russia and Ukraine, Europe sent them guns. Did you ever hear the like of it in your life? The European Parliament, is supposed to be for peace, sent guns into areas where young kids, hot-headed that they are, will learn how to use those guns. And poor old Ukraine will never have peace if it doesn't stop, the pain balance doesn't stop. Now, not in a year's time, now. Exactly. Very well said. Um, yeah, uh, of course, with peace with justice, with with balance and, and real dialogue is what's needed here. Look, thank you very much, Mairead. That's that's me done. I'm going to hand over now to uh, Eilish Ward, who's going to uh, respond to what she's just heard. But thank you so much for coming today. Thank you, Barry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mairead, and thanks to Barry. And uh, I, I, I feel this is a very difficult task because uh, I wasn't quite sure what you were going to talk about and you have covered such a wide range of issues. But the, the one thing I want to say most importantly is the, uh, uh, you know, as a young person who grew up in, in Ireland and was very aware of you uh, during your peace activism, during the very difficult time, it, it's, it's so wonderful to see you now with that same raw passion that allowed you stand in a very difficult terrain when the, the entirety of life in Northern Ireland was divided between those two polarities in a very bloody conflict. And it's very touching and inspiring to see that raw passion and that clarity, such clarity that you have still here. So thank you very much for that, Mairead. Um, then I, I think I have, if uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to organize my thoughts as I, as I think, but I have about two other issues that I want to just raise. One is that I was, 
I'm very struck by your opening comments in relation to the question of um, spirituality um, and the link that Barry made very nicely there at the end between humiliation and violence. And this to me is a, is a question of spirituality and, and um, I've done some research on Cambodian peace workers who work with the returned Khmer Rouge families um, and some of them made the case of the need to be kind to the Khmer Rouge as a, an, a manifestation of their Buddhist spirituality. So that account of spirituality in Buddhism, which is quite different from, I think, what we think spirituality to be in the West, that allowed them make a really dangerous and difficult and challenging journey to be kind to the genocide there. So I, I think you're absolutely right to identify the need for that very deep connection to human, human connection, human to human connection, and the recognition that we are all very vulnerable uh, uh, humans, ultimately, at the end of the day. Um, so I, I, that was re really wonderful. I think the, the other thing that this deb debate has raised, and it's very pressing now, is the question of Ireland's future neutrality. Um, I'm not sure at all what arguments can be made or how um, how to proceed in terms of protecting and defending Irish neutrality, because it's very tattered. It's a very tattered thing. And the very simplistic perspective that the media and public opinion are taking is, you know, the current uh, conflict in Ukraine proves that Ireland needs to defend itself by joining NATO and there's no other option. Um, so I think this is something we're going to have to battle, uh, tackle, not battle, tackle, um, and to do that in a way that, um, I think recognizes the complexity of the situation. The final point I'd just like to make, and this, this I found very challenging, I will say, I will admit, Mairead, um, your view of Putin. Um, and so I, I, I it, it, you know, I, I, I admit that I find, I can't deny that I found this quite a challenging view that you presented, and I'll have to do some more thinking about this. Um, but the idea that the Ukrainians should sit down with Putin and, sort of negotiate with him in accordance, given the demands that he has set, which basically is the denial of the sovereignty, the sovereignty of the state. Uh, he's essentially denied the sovereignty of, of Ukraine and breached international law uh, um, and the norms and the practices and procedures of international law in his effort to prove and swallow up, uh, to prove that Ukraine has no right to exist and swallow it up. So. And yet what you say does contain some truth. Um, there is some truth in what you say about the humiliation of, of, of Russia and our demon, very simplistic demonization of Putin. But I do need to think a good deal more about this idea that, that the Ukrainians should, um, that there's some equivalence between these two powers um, and that the two powers can somehow sit down together and negotiate and that Putin has, I think you said that he has offered the solution um, but basically the solution is the denial of the, of the sovereignty of Ukraine. So maybe this is something we can talk a little bit more about, uh, and I will certainly do some more thinking about that. And now I'll hand back to Eamon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eilish. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Eilish. Uh, 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 thank you for that. Um, and again, thanks, Mairead, for, for your talk. We've had uh, uh, lots of responses in the chat. Um, and a number of people just offering their thanks to you. Um, one comment said uh, to thank you for bringing calm and clarity. And again, I was just thinking that 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 you are very calm and yet very passionate in your words. So I think there's a kind of deep appreciation for, for people who are listening. But we of course, we have lots of comments and questions and, and thanks to everybody who uh, for, for putting uh, putting them down in the chat. So I have 
in the, in the next few minutes, Mairead, maybe we have a little bit of time to address some of those questions. Um, and, and maybe I'll just start off with, um, you mentioned uh, you, you being very disappointed with Ireland's role on the Security Council. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously that would seem perhaps to be an opportunity. But I mean, what, what, what do you think that really Ireland's capacity on the Security Council is given the way it's the whole thing is structured and the notion of the power of veto, which we've already seen. I mean, what, what in, in actual, uh, in real terms, could Ireland be doing on the Security Council, which clearly it's not at the moment? Well, Ireland can on the Security Council encourage the others to solve this problem through dialogue, through negotiation, um, not through war, not through sending weapons in to one side or the other. Um, and out of their own experience, the Irish know how this helped solve the problem in Northern Ireland. They accommodated those who were those voices for peace. So the Ireland can do that and not send guns. You know, if pe people are afraid, we have fear of uh, ethnic annihilation. We have fear of others different groups, we have fear of dying. But if a gun comes into a room, people are afraid. So they take their little children and they run in their thousands. It's all around the world. We've seen it here in the Falls Road in 76 and uh, 69. People in the Lower Falls got their, their goods and ran, <coughs> ran out of the way because there was guns. Guns are the problem. So get the guns out of the situation. Go for a ceasefire. Look at how you can provide security for Russia, which is frightened of its security, and how you can provide security and um, neutrality for the Ukraine and, and help the people who are poor. Have a conference and bring people who are involved in it. And you know, Elish, I can understand you saying you're not sure about Putin, but you know what? I would talk to anybody if it meant serving, saving one life. Anybody. And, you know, if you look at the history of how these wars, wars are started, first you start by demonizing their leaders. This is, this is, everybody knows that. And you can't demonize them enough and you can't demonize the people enough. The people of the Ukraine and the people of Russia know each other. They have friends, they're quite close to each other. Build on that friendship, on that knowledge, and insist to sit down, have a ceasefire, get rid of the guns, look at bo both securities. I remember meeting Gorbachev many years ago, and that man worked so hard, he agreed with the dissolution of the Soviet states. And the promise to Gorbachev was, we will not extend NATO towards the Russian border. The West, NATO gave that promise, and of course they ignored it. Because if you look at the map now, NATO has totally surrounded all those ex-Soviet states with their nuclear weapons, and they're in there, and their next aim is to get rid of Russia, and uh, they'll do that through sanctions, through crucifying the people with sanctions, then they move on to China, and who's next? We've got to call a halt to NATO. NATO is a military force. It's not a peacekeeping force. And when we listen on the radio to the generals from NATO telling us how they're going to take the next country, America went in there when Ukraine was looking for economic help and helped stir up the anger and the hatred. And what did we see in there? We seen fascist groups going out and killing people up in the Donbass. This is a highly explosive, dangerous, dangerous situation in Ukraine because they have history. They have a very sad, sad history. And you cannot play politics in these countries where the emotions rise so high and they have a political history. So you set the world on fire. So I appeal to NATO and I appeal to the Americans, please do not set the world on fire by playing with highly dangerous situations which could stroke a third world war and nuclear weapons are there.
It's too dangerous. We're in a dangerous world. We need peace voices. We need politicians who are statesmen and women. We don't need war mongers. So uh, uh, thank, thanks, uh, uh, Murray. Wouldn't it be great to see Ireland playing a, a, an active role in, in terms of promoting neutrality and nonviolence? But doesn't seem to be quite the way at the moment. A few people are asking about the role of nonviolence in actually, um, uh, you know, for example, civilian based defense in the Ukraine. I mean, should we be going or should people be going to the Ukraine to participate in, 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 in that? Or I mean, would, would that be, you know, again, people been setting themselves up to be killed. I mean, so, I mean, what was, is the potential for um, the support of nonviolence in, in Ukraine, do you think? Well, nonviolence is a weapon of love uh, and people can first go off, take a great interest in the situation and learn about it because we don't know about these countries. And, Pray for people of Ukraine, and I was glad to see that the, the, the churches called for prayers. But above all, call for the Irish government to take a leading role in peace and conflict resolution. And they know how to do it, they've done it. And call for the British government to be responsible and not to be encouraging weapons into those countries. They're far too dangerous and keep up the campaign in Ireland to stop the arms race. You know, they're building more and more arms traders here in Ireland. We've got to stop that and build our own peace process as well. So uh, it can be done and stop demonizing the Ukrainian people or the, the Russian people. And for all the people who've lost somebody, my heart goes out to them. And also to help the refugees where we can because they, they've just fled because they're afraid. But the sooner things calm down and they can stay in their own country and not be afraid, that's the important thing. Settle this conflict now so people can stay in their own country. Okay. Right. Um, I think also one of the things we've noticed around this conflict is that there has been you know, a huge outpouring of empathy you know, in, in Western countries for the for the victims of of of, of, of war in Ukraine, um, you know, and support there has been you know an, an openness to receive refugees and Poland and other countries of Ireland has been offering to take. However, this seems in firm contrast sometimes to the way uh, we look at victims of conflicts in places such as perhaps Somalia or maybe in, in, in Palestine or you know, other places like Yemen, for example, where we, we don't see that sort of same outpouring of empathy, I think, for, for the victims of, of those conflicts. I mean, wh why do you think this is? I mean, is it about seeing other white Europeans suffer um, that, 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 you know, that makes us you know, weigh, weigh in with support? Um, wh why don't we feel the same way about people suffering in Yemen, Palestine, Somalia, and so on? Well, I think that, you know, we don't see our world as one world. You know, we, we are one world. Every human being has the same kind of emotions. They all wake up in the morning and are faced with trying to make the best of their day and human beings suffer. And if we realize that suffering, and if it's a child in Yemen or a child in any country in the world, America, Russia, wherever, there are kids too. And it's heartbreaking to think that we have allowed a world where thousands of children go to bed at night hungry because we consider a nuclear weapon uh, and drones we consider them more important than human life and we children. So maybe if we can just deepen our roots of humanity and compassion, like the Dalai Lama always says, compassion. So that if children go to bed hungry or they're killed, there are children too, and we feel for them. And people are very good, they do feel. And, and they feel for the kid for what's happening in, in, in the Ukraine. But the best kind of feeling you can show for those children is to demand that their, their governments 
and other governments start putting their budgets out of militarism and war into education, into healthcare, into giving them somewhere to live, into giving them jobs and a better life. Not now the way our policies are just all geared towards war and militarism and killing and demonizing each other. That's not good enough. You know, I love the Dalai Lama because he always says, he always says, kindness is the greatest virtue. And it's, it's true. And if we are kind to each other, we'll not kill each other. And he's just brought out a lovely book. And this book with, with Tutu uh, is joy, joy, have joy in your life. Well, you know, it's easy to say have joy in your life when you have something on the table and a bed to lie down in. We've got to uphold the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and start giving kids and young people hope. Because if we go down this road, it's just, it's such a waste of, of everything. It's a waste of our gifts, our talents, our lives. Such a waste, you know? Mm -hmm. So let's maybe challenge our governments to do better. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, for, for sure. And ju just finally, Mairead, you mentioned the word hope and joy there at the end. And I think, you know, a number a number of people mentioned in the chat that, you know, your, your vision, it, despite all the, all the, the you know, the, the, the difficulties we're living with in the world, your vision seems to be a very hopeful vision. And I mean, what inspires you in that? And where, where does that hope come from? Just so that maybe we could share a little bit of that, because I think sometimes a lot of people, a lot of us and a lot of people are feeling very pessimistic about the world as it is now. Oh, I think if you look all around you, there are good people everywhere, you know, and look at what happened during the pandemic, how people came out and they were good to each other and they looked after each other and, uh, and they want to open their homes and they want to be better. You know, people want to have a peaceful world. And so we have got, that's where our hope is. Uh, and I think it, uh, we're on a change of consciousness you know, we now are looking at how do we develop a science of peace instead of a science of war. We've had war. They're old fashioned. They've all been done. They're no use to us. Uh, so how do we develop a science of peace? Peace in our universities, peace in our colleges. Peace, I mean, if Russia and America got together and developed a science of peace, and it's all there. I mean, the, the, a lot of the theologians and the philosophers and the scientists have been looking at how do you make peace? Let's learn peace and start making peace and bring down the barriers and stop, stop killing each other. Mairead, uh, thanks a million. Lots of people commenting. They're loving what you say and uh, taking inspiration from, from your words tonight. So we, we thank you heartily for 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 coming and, and speaking with us tonight and, and and offering us those hopeful words so thanks a million Mairead and I'm going thank to hand you, back now to Miriam thank you Eamon. thank you yeah thank you Mairead and it's so refreshing to hear about the possibility of peace and truth and thank you and thanks um, to everyone for joining us this evening hope you can join us again next Wednesday when John Lannan of Shannon Watch will be in conversation with Quiva Butterly, Irish human rights activist, and our respondent will be Mark Garavan, peace activist and writer. So we'll leave you now with the image of a Jack B. Yeats painting called Grief. This painting is Yeats' most powerful expression of his absolute abhorrence of war. It originates from a sketch entitled let there be no more war. At the center of the painting, an apocalyptic figure on horseback gestures aggressively. And in the foreground, an elderly man looks at the blood that drips from his hands, while a mother places her arm protectively around a small child. So, Ihawa. Thank you.